Well, as Stephanie mentioned, we're studying Jonah. Now, I thought, you know, I've heard this story since I was a little bitty in Sunday school. So, I, I thought I had squeezed all of the revelation there was out of the book of Jonah. But, boy, was I, did I have something coming. Because there is a lot more in those four short chapters than, than meets the eye. And that's the way it is with all of God's word. Um, you think you, uh, you know something, but you just ask the Holy Spirit to show you what it is for you that he wants you to see. And a whole new world will open up even in familiar scriptures. So let's go now to the book of Jonah. And today we're going to talk about why Jonah was running from the Lord. Wednesday we, we established who Jonah was and, and who Nineveh was and, and what was going on there at the time and what God wanted done. But now we're going to see why it was that Jonah rebelled against God. You know, there are always reasons. Pe people have reasons for doing what they do. There are causes for, for people's uh, behavior. So, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, as I mentioned on Wednesday night, Nineveh looks a lot like 21st century America because Nineveh means uh, offspring of ease. They were wicked, but they were wealthy. And they had, relatively speaking, an easy life. And Nineveh uh, is part of Assyria, or it was part of the Assyrian Empire. It was not in Israel. Now, this is one of the interesting things for us to consider as we uh, go through this study in the book of Jonah, is most of the places in the Bible, you see God sending his prophets to talk to Israel, to talk to the covenant people of God. Well, Nineveh, they did not have a covenant with God, they, they were not part of, they were not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as far as we can tell, that they were not proselytes to the Jewish religion. So what's going on here? Why is God sending his prophet to these, this heathen country to tell them to repent? What's he calling us to do? Go to a heathen country. And to, oh, yes, I know it says, well, Christ, you know, America is a Christian nation. But there is, there's, just like there's Republicans in name only, there are Christians in name only, right? That when, when push comes to shove, they're really worshiping a different God. They're really serving a different agenda, etc., cetera, et cetera, But the point is, God loves them too. And, you know, here's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really going to kind of skim over some things in the story of Jonah. We'll, we'll develop this as we go along. But when they heard the preaching of Jonah, they repented at least for 150 years. Now, if you read Nahum, you find that 150 years later, they had slid back into their wickedness and they were judged. But when they heard the preaching of Jonah, they repented. What this tells you is that God has put in every person a conscience. It says this in the first chapter of Romans. It says that, that that which can be known of God is made known to every man through nature. Nature itself reveals the glory of God. It reveals the, the laws of God, the character of God. Every man knows when he is stealing or murdering or committing adultery that he's doing wrong. Whether they're Christian or Buddhist uh, or Mohammedan. They know, they, inwardly, a man's heart knows what is right and wrong because God shows it to them. And this has been the case for every man, every woman, and every nation throughout all of history. So then, well, why doesn't everybody serve God? Well, why don't we serve God 100% of the time? 
right? Because of the devil, the flesh, and the world. All right? So this is Nineveh that he was sent to preach to. Uh, verse 3. But <laughs> Jonah <clears throat> didn't go to Nineveh. He arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So if he was going from the presence of the Lord, he was out of the will of God at this point. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. He went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, Tarshish is mentioned here three times, or is it twice? Anyway, Tarshish, I looked this word up in Smith's Bible Dictionary, and it was not helpful at all. <laughs> Sometimes that happens when you look up in Bible study aids. Even, even the venerable old Strong's Concordance, sometimes you, you look up the meaning of the word, and it means what it means in English. It's like, well, okay, well, where, where am I here with this? Well, one thing it did tell me that I found interesting is there were several places that were actually named Tarshish, and they weren't all in the same, on the same ocean. Uh, some of them were on the Mediterranean Sea. Some of them were in the Indian Ocean. So now, obviously, if he got on a boat in Joppa, that, that's the current city of Haifa in Israel. That is on the Mediterranean Sea. It's near Tel Aviv. So he was obviously headed toward whatever they were calling Tarshish that was on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the, what, the, what the Smith Bible Dictionary um, speculated was that Tarshish was just the name that the Israeli, that the Jews gave for any far off land from which they were deriving things that they were getting riches from. Um, keep the place here. Go to Ezekiel chapter 27. This is key. I mean, this is not just extraneous information I'm giving you here. Uh, Ezekiel 27, verse 12. Here in God is, is uh, prophesying against Tyre, which was the, the merchant uh, capital of the world there on the Mediterranean Sea. And in Ezekiel 27, 12, it says, Tarshish was your merchant because of your many luxury goods. So if a ship was going to Tarshish, they were going to get some booty. They were going to get some stuff and bring it back and make a lot of money. It was commerce. Okay? If, if, uh, if the prospects in Israel didn't look good, then they went to sea to find their fame and fortune. It's always been that way. You know, it, when, when things got looking kind of bleak in Europe back in the 1600s and 1700s, what did they do? They got on a boat and came to North America. And here we are today, right? Looking for fame and fortune. All right, back to Jonah chapter 1. So what Jonah was doing, it wasn't just that he was fleeing from, from uh, something that he was not wanting to do. You will find throughout the scriptures people fleeing for various reasons. Uh, even Mary and Joseph, after the baby Jesus was born, the angel came to them and told them to flee. He told them to flee because Herod was going to try to kill the baby Jesus. And so they fled to Egypt. Now there was another time when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was about to uh, invade the land of Israel and the people of Israel decided they wanted to flee to the land of Egypt. And Jeremiah said, no, don't go. Surrender yourself to the invading army and they will treat you well. But they didn't listen to him. They did flee to Egypt and the army pursued them there and killed them all. But he wasn't fleeing to Egypt. And you say, well, Egypt is the world. Well, guess what? Tarshish is the world. Okay, we're just talking about different aspects of the world. Okay. So, what was the problem here was that 
Jonah, when, when, when he decided he wasn't going to do what God said, he thought, well, okay, then what do I want to do? And what he decided he wanted to do was seek fame and fortune. Okay, now, go to Jonah chapter 2. We're going to see one of the many revelations that he gets uh, when God arrests his backsliding, when he is in the belly of the fish, is found in verse 8. It says, I'll read this out of the um, New King James Version. The Amplified gets it right, but it says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Well, Jonah realized that what he was doing, instead of uh, obeying God, he was pursuing worthless idols by going to Tarshish. Well, now you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, the, the Nineveh had a lot of wealth. They had a lot of resources. It was offspring of ease, after all. Well, you know what? This tells us something about why Joseph, not Joseph, Jonah fled. Keep the place in Jonah. Go to Luke chapter 6. There is a principle. And we find this in Luke chapter 6. Let's read verse 41. It says, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not perceive the plank in your own eye? There's another place in Romans chapter 1. It pretty much says the same thing. It says, You who criticize and condemn another you're doing the same thing you're condemning and criticizing the other one for doing. This is a principle. The speck that you see in your brother's eye, you only see because that is a familiar thing to you. A familiar spirit, if you will. Uh, that, you know, everybody's got specks in their eyes. Everybody it, it has, has problems in their flesh, but the problem in somebody else's flesh that bugs you is a problem that you have in your flesh. Right? Anyway, that was apparently the deal here with Jonah is Jonah had worthless idols and they were a land of, of careless ease and he, he was jealous of that. Well, let's read back up a little bit here in Luke 6. Go to verse 31. It says, Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those to whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive back as much. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. For your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Well, you know what? The Ninevites, like the Americans, like the British, like every other empire in this world, was not kind to those who were unthankful. And, and they only... Uh, lended to those to whom they expected to get it back. And they only loved their friends and only did good to those who did good to them. And Jonah was the same way. Therefore, well, be merciful. Verse 36, be merciful. See, what Jonah realized in the belly of the whale was if you go pursuing idols, you lose mercy. God's not going to be merciful to you. What it's telling you is that there is an unmerciful spirit behind those who are greedy for gain. Because if you are merciful, 
You don't want to be hoarding things to yourself. You want to give. Heard an interesting teaching this week that God doesn't use money. Money is not part of God's kingdom. Well, you just passed the offering plate. What are you saying? That's not part of God's kingdom. No, God doesn't need money. What God is about is about seed sowing and harvesting. I mean, look, look at what God has created here. He didn't need money to do all of this. We need money to plant trees and to plant gardens and, and fields and, and wheat and cattle and so forth. God doesn't need all of that. He speaks a word and that word is a seed. And when it comes time for the seed to sprout, he says, go out and get it. Right? It's people who are greedy that think they have to have money. Uh, th these are revolutionary ideas in 21st century America, let me tell you. They might call me a socialist or something for saying this. But see, socialism is greed too. If they're just thinking, well, the government has all the money, so I'll just go to the government and get what I need. Folks, that ain't going to work very much longer. Okay. Anyway, back to Jonah, chapter 1. <clears throat> he fled to, to Joppa to get on a boat to Tarshish. Well, now, Joppa, according to J.B. Jackson's Dictionary of Scripture, proper names, Joppa means to be fair to him. Well, you know what? God was fair to Jonah. <laughs> he was exceedingly fair and let me tell you, this encourages me because I have not always been obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry to say. But God is still fair to us. He, he, he loves freedom more than he loves control. God will let us do things that he does not approve of. And we will reap the results and hopefully learn our lessons. Joppa means fair to him, and Tarshish, are you ready? Drum roll, where's Steve? He's not here, so we don't have a drum roll here. Tarshish means she will cause poverty, or she will shatter. Well, but these were the ones who produced the luxury goods for the world. These were where the, the diamond mines were and the silver mines were located, and these were the ones who, who produced all the luxury goods that they enjoyed in the land of of Israel and in Egypt and everywhere else. So why does that cause poverty? Because it says it, all throughout the Bible that those who crave to be rich will fall into snares and miserable um, perishing. And Jonah had to learn that lesson. Okay, but why was it that Jonah preferred uh, seeking fame and fortune over obeying God. I mean, first of all, we know from another place in the Bible that Jonah was accustomed to hearing from God and speaking the word that God had given him. Go to second, keep the place in Jonah, go to second Kings chapter 14. Jonah was not a stranger to God. He was not a stranger to God's word. But as we read what Jonah said in another occasion, we get a glimpse of the kind of message that Jonah did feel comfortable bringing forth. 2 Kings 14, verse 23. Well, let's, let's set this, yeah, 23, that's a good place to start. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Josiah, Joash, rather, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin. But pay attention to what happens here in verse 25. But he restored the territory to Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah. He was a wicked king, but he did good things for Israel. He restored the prosperity of Israel. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
So what's happened, what, what, that, what does that tell you is that uh, prosperity is not necessarily a sign of you having God's favor, or at least you personally having God's favor. And he did this, guess what? According to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which had been spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. And this is the same Jonah that we're talking about. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, whether bond or free, and that there was no helper for Israel. So God restored the prosperity of Israel, not because Jeroboam was such a great guy, and him giving that message to Jonah was not because Jonah's uh, priorities were necessarily in the right place. Bottom line, Jonah was a prosperity preacher. You see that here. What, what did he preach? What, he, Jonah gave the word to the king. said, King, you're going to have the whole land back. You're going to prosper and be in health as, as the Lord wants you to prosper. But that's not what the word says. The word says prosper and be in health as what? Your soul prospers. What do the prosperity preachers say? Oh yeah, they may quote that, but how much soul prosperity are they preaching? How much denying self are they preaching? How much are they seek first the kingdom of God? Don't seek money first. Don't seek things first. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me, says the Lord. Is that what the pre prosperity preachers are preaching? None of the ones I've heard, but I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on that. Anyway, go back to Jonah. So this is, this is one clue as to why when God told him not to go preach a prosperity message, but to pre preach a message of uh, straighten up and fly right or you're going to hell, he said, I don't want to preach that. That, do that doesn't build my congregation. You know, that, that doesn't fill my auditorium with tens of thousands of people. And, he, and he, he was used to telling a wicked king, you're going to prosper. He was used to telling people that are homosexuals and, and living in adultery and, and say, oh, well, God loves you and, and God, Jesus bore your sin and everything's great between you and God. Just enjoy your blessings. That was the message he was used to preaching. And God, didn't, God said, hey, put that one away. I've got a different message for you, boy. He said, I don't want to do that. He said, I, I want more of the good stuff. So he gets on a ship and goes to Tarshish. But there's more. There's more. Go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Well, see, Jonah's steps were slipping because he wasn't walking where God told him to walk, right? For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So Jonah, not only did he, was he not accustomed to heaven to, to preach a stern message, the people that God told him to go to preach to, they were prospering, and it says they were wicked. And so he was saying, hey, I don't want, those people are wicked. But look, they've got all of this money. Hey, I'm envious of that. I need to, I, you know, I need some more money. So how am I going to go get money? Well, Somebody, you know, some little voice in his head says, well, get on the ship to Tarshish. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Verse um, 21. Psalm 73, verse 21. It says, For my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind by being envious of the wicked it will grieve your heart. It will vex your mind. Or as it says in the Amplified, your heart will be grieved, embittered, and in a state of ferment, and pricked in your heart with a sharp fang of an adder. 
To be envious of the wicked gives you a bad attitude. There's another example of that. Let's go to, keep the place in Psalms. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Verse 9. It says, There was a certain man called Simon who had previously practiced sorcery <clears throat> in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. <clears throat> but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both women, men and women were baptized. And then Simon himself also believed. And he went and was baptized. Okay, Phil, Simon apparently... Uh, had a conversion experience here. Now this tells us something. This tells you that this, the old stuff that you did back in the world doesn't evaporate instantly when you get born again. Okay? He still needed some deliverance, obviously, as we will see. <clears throat> then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. Now go to verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. American Christian, learn the lesson here. God's gifts are not bought with money. Well, buy, buy, my tape, buy my CD series on, on how to prosper and, and, and the, the kingdom principles and, and God will bless you. You don't have to buy their CD series to find out how God will bless you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will bless you. Put him first in your life and then see what God does. And then obey him when he tells you whatever it is. Verse 19, he said, well, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why was he wanting that? He wanted to be seen as, as a, a great man of God. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Kind of like that person over there in Psalm 73 who was envious of the wicked. His heart wasn't right. What did he say about his heart? He said it was embittered and it was in a state of ferment. Well, let's keep reading. Acts 8.22, Peter says to Simon, he says, Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Jonah was poisoned by bitterness and bound by idolatry. He was still God's man. God called him his servant back over there in 2 Kings. But there was still some stuff in his heart that was not right and he was not facing it. Now Christian, just cause you have listened to word preaching for 30 something years doesn't mean that everything in your heart right now is just right. And if it is just right right now, that doesn't just mean, well, okay, I'm in like Flynn. I can skate into the rapture. Something might happen tomorrow that might throw you for a loop. You need, you need to make sure every moment of every day, I need to make sure every moment of every day that my heart is open and clear before God. Blessed are the pure in heart. We've got to keep our hearts pure 
all the time. You may be pure today, but you go turn on that TV and there's a bunch of impurity that can come into you tomorrow. We've got to keep our lives pure. Jonah's life was not pure. He was man, God's man now, but his life was not pure. I mean, we can see that by his behavior. Go back to Jonah. So he gets on the boat and he goes to Tarshish. 